Uh, indeed. So I think I must be here as a bit of, um, I think I must be here as a bit of light relief. Uh, so I'm going to promise you no statistics and I'm going to promise you nobody dies. Uh, and as a relief from all the really quite challenging um, head and neck cancer work, I'm, I'm going to present some stuff which is mostly not cancer. I think it is pretty much a legal requirement that any talk about children has to start with a statement, children are not like adults. But I think what, what comes through in all the talks that have, that have happened today is that on the one hand, you've got uh, obviously a lot of surgical skill and the ability to operate. But on the other, you know, to get good results, you also need an intimate knowledge of your pathology and your patients. And, you know, that's really important. So I think if, you, if you're looking at doing some children's head and neck as a bit of light relief from all your adult cancer work, you know, the surgical skills you have are very much transferable, but the intimate knowledge of the pathology just take a little bit of work because it is very different. And we're talking about very different pathology, anatomy, physiology. So those are the things I'm going to talk about um, today. Um, and just to talk about the kind of head and neck pathology that I'm dealing with, I don't do any carcinoma. I do some tumor work, but uh, none of it is carcinoma. Mostly what I'm doing is some lymph nodes, some tumor work there, a lot of infectious work. The commoner congenital anomalies, so the thyroglossus preauriculars, the, the second branchial cleft sinuses, so these things are very common. Some of the uh, dermoids, particularly the midline nasal ones, which I will talk about. We get a lot of lymphatic malformations. Uh, and then, of course, the other head and neck surgery that we're doing is airway surgery, which um, is a lot of what we do in head and neck. And I do a, a drooling clinic, so I'm doing a lot of work on children with drooling and aspiration. And most of my salivary surgery is for the management of drooling and aspiration, some of it for tumours and some for nasty first branchial cleft anomalies. So that's the range of pathology that I'm dealing with. And clearly that is going to be very different for, uh, from adult surgery. Okay. Some thyroid down there. One of my colleagues does a thyroid. Um, so the first thing is to say that, you know, children's anatomy is very different and very changeable compared to adult anatomy where your landmarks are fixed. And there are certain things that are on, on our side and there are certain things that are working against us. So the ones that are on our side is children have a very short neck. That is great. The young children in particular, the classic time when I think that's really helpful, the second branchial cleft sinuses. And obviously this girl's got bilateral second branchial cleft sinuses uh, here, but she's also got preauricular sinuses. She's got branchial otorenal syndrome. But if we just look at the branchial cleft sinuses, as you'll know, in adolescents, adults, if you're going to excise a sinus tract that goes all the way from the lower third of sternomastoid all the way up to the tonsil, then you may need more than one incision in the neck. And, you know, that is not unusual uh, to need more than one step bladder kind of incision. When you operate in very young children with a short neck, you can get all the way from the bottom of sternomastoid to the tonsil through one incision and you don't need the step bladders. So I like to operate on these children young if we're going to operate if the sinus is symptomatic and if people want something done then do it young and don't delay it because it it makes the surgery a lot easier the mid face is short and underdeveloped the nose is short the maxilla is small pre-puberty so classic time when that helps us is midline nasal dermoids now this one here um, is presenting as an infection through the left nasal bone but there's a big cyst underneath the nasal bones a tiny little punctum on the tip of the nose, which would be very easy to miss. But clearly there's a nasal dermoid with a little tract going through under the nasal bones. Um, I, I tend to do these through an external rhinoplasty approach. I think it's far and away the best cosmetic result, but you can get all the way up to the dura of the anterior cranial fossa from the collimella of the nose if you operate young. So certainly preschool, early primary school years, you can easily get from the collimella to the dura without any bother. And I've done four or five now with resection of the dura and repair from below, all done through an external rhinoplasty without the need for any external incisions. So here's an example of one with a dermoid sitting right through the inner table on the dura. Very easy to take out through an external rhinoplasty if you do it young. So there are times when early intervention is, is good. And, and this is one with a sinus on the, on the lip actually that goes all the way through to the skull base uh, through the middle of the septum and you can you can easily get a good result. The one on the left here was done by, um, by a colleague from another discipline with a very visible 
external scar, which I don't think is necessary for the vast majority, unless there's already skin loss from infection, because I think the cosmetic result you get, as on the right side of the slide from a, an external rhinoplasty, is much, much better. And the child's going to live with the consequences of this for 90 years, so you've got to get it right. There are times when the anatomy is working against us, though. So the classic one is that the, um, the thyroid gland is very high and still descending. So when we operate in neonates, the thyroid isthmus is often at the level of the thyroid cartilage or cricoid and is still in the process of descending. So whenever you do any kind of airway procedure in children, particularly tracheostomy in babies, always divide the thyroid isthmus because if it isn't in your way now, it will be in your way at some point and it will interfere with tracheostomy tube changes. So it really is important that the thyroid isthmus is divided for all of these. And as well as the thyroid gland being high, um, the, the larynx itself is very high and I'll touch on that in a minute. But what I thought I'd do is just talk through some particular operations as we go along, just to illustrate uh, the steps that we take to try and avoid complications. So classic one is a pediatric tracheostomy, and this is how we do it. And this is pretty standard, I think, in most children's hospitals. Um, this is how we do it. Always in the operating room, never in ICU, because you know, we, we don't do that many, and you just want to make everything easy for yourself. Good neck extension with a, a chin strap and a shoulder roll, Small vertical incision because it keeps you in the midline, stops you wandering off to the sides and gives you a nice little closure at the end when you stitch the stoma. Um, you excise the subcutaneous fat. Rather, I don't use any retractors. They just get in the way. And if you're constantly trying to dig through fat with retractors, you can't see a thing. Just take out the subcutaneous fat. It takes you right down onto the strap muscles and you can see everything without any retractors. Divide the thyroid isthmus, separate the straps, divide the thyroid isthmus, Stay sutures of uh, nylon around the third ring, which you use as retractors during the procedure and as an aid to tracheostomy tube changes post-op. Um, a vertical incision in rings two, three, and four, and then suture the cut edges of the cartilage to the skin. So you suture trachea to skin to exclude muscle and exclude fat and exclude everything and just give you a perfect little round stoma where the cleaner on the ward can put the tube in if it falls out. And it's very much a safety thing and you should do that every time. Always cotton tapes, never Velcro. Velcro uh, can cut through the plastic of the tube. It can be undone, even with a baby that gets its arms stuck underneath, can undo Velcro. Velcro is very dangerous. So always cotton tapes tied by the surgeon without the shoulder roll. And here you see, you know, cutting, the, cutting into the trachea and taking the cut ends of the tracheal rings and stitching them to the skin to make a little round stoma. So that's how we do tracheostomies in children. And all of the steps there are about minimizing the risk of complications and making life easy for yourself. Uh, we spoke about the thyroid isthmus being very high. Well, also the larynx itself is very high and the normal position in neonates is that the hyoid bone is superficial to the thyroid cartilage. So that means that your thyroid membrane is in a uh, axial plane. And then through the first few years of life, the larynx descends and the hyoid ends up superficial to the thyroid cartilage with the thyroid membrane lying in the coronal plane. And uh, it's important, particularly if you're doing a thyroglossal duct cyst, I know that some of our colleagues in pediatric general surgery are told to use the thyrohyoid membrane as their landmark for surgery. And I've seen a couple of nasty complications. I'm aware of two cases where part of the thyroid cartilage has been excised because they thought it was the hyoid. And I think you can get lost when you try to use a, a changeable, non-standard landmark like the thyrohyoid membrane, uh, because it's not a landmark. It changes all the time and it's not reliable. So uh, I think the, the reliable landmark in the neck is the cricoid and it's the only one. If the larynx is very high, you can't feel the thyroid notch in babies. If you're looking for a landmark for a tracheostomy, say, the cricoid is the only reliable one. So you stick your finger in the notch, of the sternum, you run up the front and the first proper thing you come to is the cricoid and that will never fail. So that is a proper landmark, whereas something changeable and variable like the thyroid membrane is not an acceptable landmark. So this is how we do thyroglossal ducts. Well, this, actually, this picture is how we don't do thyroglossal duct cysts. Dissecting the cyst, trying to dissect a tract and then taking a big chunk of hyoid bone. The thyroglossal duct cyst is a very thin membranous epithelial tract with a million branches. You can't dissect it, not safely. You cannot dissect the duct. Um, and any attempt to dissect the cyst 
and its little attached duct will lead to you leaving it behind and will lead to a substantial recurrence rate. And the recurrence rates are 25, 30% in many published series because of that. So this is more what we do. We do a central block dissection. We make no attempt to find the cyst, no attempt to find the tract. We stay in normal tissue and do a wide resection distant from the lesion itself. So we just take some cutting diathermy at the level of the thyroid isthmus, cut through just the, the edge of the straps and take a central strip of strap muscle and pretracheal fascia um, all the way from the thyroid isthmus, off the trachea, off the thyroid cartilage, until we get to the undersurface of the hyoid bone, take that in continuity with the strap muscles, and then take a core of uh, tongue-based muscle up to foramen cecum. And it's actually quick and easy, uh, very straightforward to do. And the recurrence rate from that is less than 5%. So that's the way that we do thyroglossal duct cysts. Uh, the final way that anatomy is working against us is the obvious one. Uh, everything is small in children and you can't see anything. So I use loops routinely for all my head and neck surgery. I know people who use the microscope. The other way to deal with it, of course, is just to wait for growth and let everything get bigger. And I've mentioned a couple of situations where I think early surgery is really important because it makes life easier. But there's also situations where the right thing to do is wait. The classic one, cosmetic penoplasty, which, you know, you just get a ton of complications if you try and do these in children before they get to school. Parents always want it done before they get to school, particularly parents who had prominent ears themselves and who were bullied. They then want the children to have surgery before they get to school. Children don't get bullied until at least seven. So we have some time. And if you wait till they're at least six, six or seven years of age, then the cartilage is strong enough that you can shape it properly and you can get a nice cosmetic result. If you do it too young, it's very soft and you don't get a good result. Also, the children don't know why they're having the surgery. They don't necessarily want the surgery. They're not motivated to look after the bandage and look after the wounds. And so you get a lot of wound dehiscence and wound infections simply because the children aren't on your side and aren't helping with the process. So never before age six. So knowing when to operate is, uh, is important. Physiology is variable. It's sometimes on our side and sometimes it's not. When it's working against us, is the effect of general anesthesia in infants, and this is well documented now that there are cognitive long-term sequelae from general anesthesia in infants. If the baby needs an anesthetic, it needs it, but if you have something which can be deferred beyond the first year, 18 months of life, most anesthetists would prefer that. So there's a certain number of things where we would delay them beyond the year, 18 months, if it's non-life-threatening. Airways are small, and a small amount of edema in an already small airway leads to a rapid worsening of the airway. Um, a high respiratory rate being dependent on the diaphragm and not using intercostals means that the child's rate dependent. They can only breathe more by breathing faster. That means they get tired very quickly. The chest wall is very compliant. And if it's recessing, then that's all wasted energy that's going into squashing the chest rather than moving air. So, all of these things mean that once children start to decompensate, they decompensate very, very quickly. But the converse of that actually helps us. The small diameter airways with a little bit of edema, it doesn't take much in the way of steroids or adrenaline to make an improvement to that. And that can make a huge improvement to the clinical condition of the child. So that's a good thing. So although we're always on a little knife edge, you don't, it doesn't take much to make a child a lot worse and they rapidly then decompensate. We can, if we're lucky, rapidly get them back with some fairly simple maneuvers uh, if, we're, if we're lucky. And you're all aware of Poiseuille's law and any child with stridor is, uh, is at least 75% of the airway has gone in terms of cross-sectional airway. You don't get stridor at rest until you've lost at least 75% of the airway in children. So that means by definition, they are all on the very steep part of the curve where a very slight change in diameter makes a huge difference to flow. And that's why they get worse very quickly, but they also get better very quickly. Um, Physiology is on our side in terms of blood loss. You know, they'll maintain circulation until it's very, until quite advanced amounts of blood loss. Um, we don't get blood loss very much in children. Uh, we don't get a huge amount really. Um, Tonsil bleeds are the one exception and possibly lymphatic venous malformations. When we do those, particularly when there's a lot of venous malformation around the subclavian or the internal jug, 
then you can lose a lot of blood with those if you're not careful. But the, the main situation where we lose blood is, is tonsillectomy. And you can see that even if bleeding isn't any more likely, the consequences of having a bleed are much more severe because you, you rapidly lose a vast proportion of the available blood because there isn't much going around. So bleeding is something that's always at the back of your mind and always a worry, but I'm, I'm happy to say it's not a situation we're in uh, very often. And uh, another aspect of physiology that's very much on our side is that children compensate. They compensate extraordinarily well for any defects that we give them. The classic one would be a unilateral vocal cord palsy. And most babies with a permanent unilateral vocal cord palsy will have pretty much a, a normal voice when they grow up. They may get a little tired at the end of the day, but, and they may not be opera singers, but they will have a pretty much normal voice. In contrast to adults, obviously, if you acquire a unilateral cord defect, you will have quite a significant voice problem. Not so much an issue in children because they compensate so well for physiological deficits. And the other thing that's very much on our side, I'm delighted to say that even when we get it wrong, the kids correct everything for us by growing and developing. And so growth often will make my mediocre results seem a lot better than they really are. So a lot of things are on our side. Um, we've got physiologically normal um, individuals mostly most of the children I operate on don't smoke, they don't drink, they have not had radiotherapy, they're not diabetic, they're not vascular paths. You know, so in contrast to your adult head and neck cancer patients, mine are you know, pristine, beautiful tissues that heal well. So um, complications are generally less likely. I get a lot less in the way of neuropraxia. So in my parotids, I'm quite happy to do a deep low parotid tumor, dissect the full facial nerve and all its branches and leave it swinging in the breeze. And the vast majority of the time, the children wake up with normal facial nerve function in a way that an 85 year old almost certainly wouldn't. So neuropraxis are a lot less common, but you do have to bear in mind, obviously the nerves are smaller and that makes them more vulnerable. Your anatomical landmarks vary with growth. And so some of them are not quite so useful. The children are healthy, as we've said before, and they heal really well, but the challenges I face is not so much poor healing patients as just really nasty, horrible uh, pathology uh, that doesn't respect anatomical boundaries. So first cleft anomalies is a classic example. Lymphatic malformations are also horrible. This is a typical first branchial cleft anomaly. So you've got this duplication of the cartilage ear canal with a cartilage tube attached to the undersurface of the ear canal. A skin opening originally would have been somewhere around the lobule, but it's been lost now because of loads of infections, the skin has died off, there's granulations with skin loss, and this cartilage tube full of dead skin that's recurrently infected. The cartilage tube is intimately related to the facial nerve and the relationship is very variable. Some bits will be deep, some will be superficial, and some will be going all around. So it's a very complex situation, You've got to monitor the facial nerve, dissect out all its branches, resect the lesion, and in this case we have to rotate in some skin to uh, help close the defect. So you know, they, they're they pretty horrible. This one here is a different child, the left side, the punctum was way down in the submandibular triangle, and there's this big cartilage sausage, which is held in the forceps there, which is thicker than your finger and full of uh, keratin debris. You can see it's superficial to the facial nerve trunk, but it's deep to the mandibular branch. And I've had some where there's various branches, superficial and deep, and it's very un unpredictable so you know this is quite a difficult dissection the facial nerve is often in a very abnormal position it can be very superficial because of the lesion or it can be very deep it can be very difficult to find and the branches are in a variable position so it's, it's quite challenging surgery to do those another thing just to mention is the acceptability of the risks that we take and i'm not suggesting for a moment that anyone in adult head and neck is slapdash or that they don't care about you know, how things are done, but it is okay to, you know, sacrifice some normal structures if you're dealing with a cancer. It's okay to just close to the wound with staples or something if you're dealing with an 80-year-old guy because the expectations are different and what is acceptable at the end of a 14-hour case is different. Whereas I'm dealing almost always with benign pathology and the malignancies I do deal with are mostly curable. So the punters that come through my door, they're going to live for 90 years with the consequences of what I do. So I cannot give them functional defects. It is not acceptable at all. And I cannot give them anything other than beautiful scars. So you've got to spend a lot of time on that. 
And it really brings it home to you when you're dealing with the most complex stuff like lymphatic malformations. They're horrible lesions that don't respect any tissue boundaries. They go through fascia, through muscles, round nerves, round vessels. They're very awkward to deal with. And if you are going to resect them, you have to be very careful with cranial nerves and other normal structures because it's not like cancer surgery. You can't just chop things out. It is not okay to give them any functional deficits. If there's a risk of that, then you probably shouldn't be operating because there are other treatments available, injection sclerotherapy being the prime one. So this little girl, um, this is her fetal MRI with a big mass uh, in the neck and tr tracheal compression. And she was delivered by an exit delivery, had a tracheostomy on day one. And there's a huge big lymphatic malformation, which is right up to the base of skull, through the parotid, through the parapharyngeal space. Uh, it extended over the midline behind the trachea. It was uh, anterior and posterior triangles of the neck and down onto the brachial plexus. So quite a, an extensive lesion. Um, quite a big lesion and sooner or later was going to have to be dealt with. The family opted for surgery and uh, I don't know if you can see behind the, the pictures there but there is um, that, that's her at school and, and she's you know 10 years old now and doing very well normal breathing normal swallowing but you know she could very easily have had multiple cranial nerve deficits. I had to dissect out 9, 10, 11, 12, phrenic nerve, the upper trunk of the brachial plexus you know, there was a lot of stuff that had to be dissected out. A lot of stuff was at risk and it was not doing her any favors if we damaged those. And that's the nature of lymphatic malformations. They're extremely variable, but the one thing they all have in common is they're horrible. So they are massive and can cross the midline and deviate the trachea. The, the one on the left came in as an emergency, as an airway problem and had to be dealt with emergently after they'd been intubated to resect all of that, crossed the midline and was horrible. We've got ones right down into the antimediastinum and right down into the chest that needed sternotomy and a joint approach. So they're horrible things to deal with. And even the very best ones, the simplest, nicest ones like this one, a very small isolated lesion in the posterior triangle are still horrible, still sat on the subclavian against the carotid and the jugular um, with multiple cranial nerves in close proximity. That's as good as it ever gets. That one, very much amenable to injection sclerotherapy. Again, the family opted to go for surgery and we've got a nice scar, no cranial nerve deficits. But unless you can get them a perfect scar and know that you're not going to get them any cranial nerve deficits, then really you cannot be doing this kind of surgery because it is, it, it is too fraught with long-term functional risks that you just can't take with these children. I'm just going to mention this one operation. It's the last thing I'm going to say, because this specific operation, I think, is the most dangerous operation we do in children. I think it is far and away the easiest way to kill a child in the operating room. I've seen, I think, six children now with immediately life-threatening complications as a result of this. Not all operated by me, but um, some of them operated by me. And and, and it's such a seemingly simple thing. You know, you've, you've removed the, uh, the tracheostomy. It hasn't healed by itself. You've left it six months, nine months. It hasn't healed. So you think, it's fine. Let's just excise the tract and close it in layers. And I've also had aware of a couple of complications from colleagues in plastics who say, oh, that tracheostomy scar is very ugly. Let me tidy that up for you for cosmetic reasons without necessarily appreciating that the skin is covering a big hole in the front of the trachea. So... You know, this seems very, very much a 10 minute registrar case. Excise the tract, close it in layers, piece of cake. But really, it is, it is terrifying, this operation. Terrifying. Because the number of kids who just cough when they wake up, blow surgical emphysema all through the neck, face, chest, lose the airway, become unintubatable, unbaggable, and you have to then pass a bronchoscope and then reopen the neck to reestablish the trachea as an emergency. So six times I've seen extensive surgical emphasis, well, three of those, two bilateral uh, pneumothorax, and a couple of other situations that were very much life-threatening. So it is, it is a, a terrifying thing to do. Um, I always close it in layers and put a non-suction drain so that if air comes out, it's got somewhere to go, put a little pen rose. But there are a number of people around the world who are now just excising it and leaving a hole, a leave a hole from the trachea to the outside world and let it heal by secondary intent. And, uh, and that's to get around these problems. So even a seemingly very, very simple procedure like closing a fistula, five minute registrar case, is, uh, is potentially fraught with risk. So 
I was just going to summarize and say that as with adults, you know, you need to know the range of pathology. You need to be intimately familiar with your pathology and be aware of the specific issues that the surgery creates. And you need to have a feel for children's growth and development to know when anatomy and physiology are working with you and when they're working against you. Um, meticulous, precise surgery in children really is, uh, really is important. I know it's important everywhere, but it's really important for children because they're going to live the consequences forever. And for a lot of the non-malignant things that we're dealing with, we always have this choice of leaving disease behind rather than sacrificing normal structures. And that is a positive decision that we will often make. Um, I don't think children get anywhere near as many complications. Uh, and that's certainly not to do with surgical skill on our part. That is simply because children just don't get so many complications. It's one of the joys of working with children, but it does mean that you do have to get it right because they will be living with these consequences long after we've retired. So um, thanks. Thank you very much, Aaron. That's absolutely wonderful talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's now, uh, yeah, Professor Matthew is going to chair the session with uh, Simon Crawley. Uh, Simon, you're happy to share the screen. Thank you, Jai, um, and welcome everybody. Thank you, Haytham, Haytham rather, for that uh, talk, which leads on nicely to the next session the, the, today. Um, I don't think there are many instances where our blood pressure or our adrenaline flows more than when we're dealing with uh, a difficult airway, especially in an emergency or life-threatening situation. And in that setting, whether it's for a benign airway problem or a malignant airway problem, that is when we have to work extremely closely with our anaesthetic colleagues. You want to have an anaesthetic colleague who is familiar all the ways that uh, we can access the airway and if it ultimately results in front of neck access well so be it but everything prior to that uh, and including that involves uh, extremely uh, close working with anaesthetists and in that situation you want someone like Simon mm -hmm. an experienced uh, airway anaesthetist uh, he's the airway lead for in Dundee for NHS Tayside uh, he works closely with our colleagues for head, neck and laryngology surgery there. Uh, he's a member of the Scottish Airway Society and the Difficult Airway uh, Society. So I can't think of anyone better than Simon to tell us a little bit about how we're going to deal with difficult cases in head, neck surgery when the airway becomes an issue. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Simon Crawley. I'm an anaesthetist here in... Uh, test side and airway lead um, and this is um, the first time I've spoken at a surgical meeting and uh, although I have been to the head and neck uh, conference in Edinburgh last year and and enjoyed it thoroughly and I've been listening through most of the morning and it's been really interesting to understand your thinking and your perspective and um, I really must agree with what Kishore said when at 11 o'clock when the artery doesn't run, it's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking for him and heartbreaking for me as well. Um, um, so I'm going to start off just, um, I mean, if this was in, if this was a face-to-face -face meeting, I would ask for a show of hands, but I'll 